Hey guys, this is Sergey. Last time we covered how async await works under the hood, and today I want to cover configure await. You probably have seen the code like that. You have an async method that calls another async method, and that another invocation is decorated with configure await false. Today I'm not going to cover when to use configure await false, what are the performance applications of this. Instead, I want just to cover why we ended up having configure await false in .NET in the first place. If you like such deep dives, please like and subscribe. And maybe share this with your friends or colleagues. This helps the channel a lot. Let's look at a very simplified diagram that explains how async method works. We have a thread that calls process data async. We call the right line, then we initiate the database operation. And once this database operation completes, we're using IO completion port thread or a thread pool thread to process the next step. But some environments do have specific threading restrictions. For instance, in Windows Forms, you cannot touch UI controls from arbitrary threads. Instead, you need to use control invoke to actually marshal the delegate invocation into the UI thread. You need to use dispatcher.invoke to run the delegate in the UI thread. And ASP.NET on full framework also has some restrictions. For instance, httpcontext.current is stored in thread local storage and you cannot access that from arbitrary threads. So what is the solution? The solution is to hide these differences in a hierarchy of classes with a base class called synchronization context. The synchronization context abstract underlying threading model and it allows executing operation in a given context. So it has just two operations, send, post, and a few other, but these two operations are crucial to execute a given delegate in a given context. So there are a few very common examples of synchronization contexts. One is for Windows Forms, one is for WPF, another one is for ASP.NET that runs on full framework. Other libraries do use synchronization context for other purposes. For instance, XUnit uses a custom synchronization context to limit the number of concurrently executed tests. One of the key selling points of async await was the ease of migration. Let's say that you have a Windows form application that uses the following code to update the data on the screen. The first line updates the progress bar, then we're getting the data, and then we're changing the text box with the result. And the idea was that you should be able to replace the result of the method from void to async task, and then make the operation like get data asynchronous, and then await the results. And everything should still work. What does it mean? It means that update text box should be executed in the same UI thread that initiated the operation. So it means that the threading model should be respected by asynchronous operation. And the way to do that is by respecting synchronization context. And now let's look at how our process data async actually should behave when the synchronization context is in place. The logic is the same, but now the method is called from the UI thread. In this case, before creating an asynchronous operation, the synchronization context is captured. Then the database operation is initiated. The completion code is executed in IO completion port thread, but now the execution needs to be marshaled to the UI thread. And this is done via synchronization context. And it means that this write line method is executed within the same context that initiated the operation, if the context was present. And let's see this logic in action. So, but instead of using Windows Forms, we're going to create a custom synchronization context that creates a single dedicated thread for processing all the work. The code is going to be available on GitHub so you can check it out in more details, but the idea is quite simple. So we need to have a blocking collection of work items and we have a dedicated thread for processing all the work. And so the two key operations are post and send. The post, it just adds the work to the working queue and send actually executes this work and waits for this execution to be completed. So it checks that if the thread is our thread, we will just call this in place, but if not, we will add the work item to our queue and wait for completion. The main logic resides in this thread procedure. This is a classical implementation of producer-consumer pattern. We're using blocking collection and get consumer enumerable to get the, all the work items out of there. And then we call the callback with a given state that was captured when the work item was created. And when the callback is executed, we're just setting the completion events to notify that the work item is processed. And let's debug the synchronization context to see how it operates in action. This code creates the synchronization context and it sets it as a current one. Then we use this trick to use test.yield to force the execution into our synchronization context. Currently, our executing thread is our main thread of the application and not the thread from the synchronization context. So once we got here, we can see that our executing thread is a dedicated thread from our single thread synchronization context. Let's look inside. So let's put the breakpoint in task.run just to see that it's going to be executed in a thread pool thread. And let's put the breakpoint here. So we got here, still the same synchronization context. And now let's get it here. 
And indeed, this is a worker thread and it's not executed in our synchronization context thread. And now the key point is that this line should be executed still in our synchronization context thread. And indeed, we can see that this is our dedicated thread from our custom synchronization context that runs each step of the async method. If we would have more than one await, each step between await would be executed in our dedicated thread. And in case of the UI, that would be very important because you cannot touch the UI elements from non the UI thread. And now we can change the code and add configurate false into it to see how it will impact the behavior. So the initial behavior should be the same. So we still call this method. We're still executing this method from a thread pool thread. But the key difference is where we're going to execute the line 10. And as you can see, this is no longer a dedicated thread. Instead, this continuation is executed by the thread pool thread. And that's what configure weight does. And that's essentially the idea behind configure weight false. It controls whether the synchronization context is respected or not. If the parameter is false, then the synchronization context is going to be ignored and the continuation of the async method is going to be executed in a thread pool thread and not within the synchronization context that potentially was present when the method was called. Let's debug and see how configurate actually works under the hood. As we can see, this method just returns a configure task awaitable, which is a struct that creates a configurate options based on this parameter. Originally, there was only one overload of configurate that was taking a boolean parameter. But recently that was extended and now we have another configurate overload that takes configurate options that controls a few more things. We're probably going to cover that in the future episodes. The main piece of code that affects the behavior is this set continuation for await. This method controls how the continuation is going to be executed. In our case, continue on capture context is false. And if it's false, we're totally ignoring the current synchronization context and we're also ignoring the task scheduler. Many people believe that configure it false only affects whether the current synchronization context is respected or not. But actually, that's not the case. The task scheduler, which is a strategy that controls how the tasks are executed, is also detached by configure it false. And in this case, both of them are totally ignored. And in this case, when the continuation of the task is executed, we're going to totally ignore both the task scheduler and the synchronization context. And that's why when we put the breakpoint here, we'll see that this method is executed from a thread pool thread and not from the dedicated thread from our synchronization context. And to get the full picture, we can debug the same code without configure wait false. The main difference is that now when we're linking the continuation with the task, we're passing true as continue and captured context. And in this case, we're going to respect the current synchronization context, which is our context, and we're creating a special await task continuations that links these two together. And we can even put the breakpoint here to see when our custom synchronization context is going to be called. So we're going to run this code. And we can see that now we're queuing the work into our work queue that then is going to be executed by our thread. And this is how we ended up calling the next step of our state machine. Let's look at a more complicated example. Let's say that we have a UI application or another application that relies on the synchronization context and it has this asynchronous operation. We want for each step of this asynchronous operation to be executed in the dedicated thread. That's why we should not be decorating async calls with configure wait false. But for the library code, it's a whole different story. Let's say that this code can be used in different contexts by different applications. And let's say that this is a hybrid mode. And let's say that this is a mix of IO and CPU bound operations. So this is an IO operation to fetch the data. And then we have a CPU intensive step to process the data. We definitely don't want to run the processing step on the UI thread. This is exactly the problem that we want to solve with asynchronous programming to make the UI responsive and not to make the CPU intensive operations on the UI thread. And that's why for the library code, we should decreate every async method with configurate false to detach the execution from the current synchronization context and not to affect the UI in some weird way. Let's look at the same logic on the diagram. Let's say that we have a UI thread that called process data and update UI. So on the same thread, we're calling write line and then we call process data async. The start of this method is still executed by the same UI thread, but then we initiate the database operation and then the UI thread is free. This is how we achieve the responsiveness of the UI. The UI thread can process new messages, can render the screen, etc. 
At some point, the database operation finishes, but the whole process data async method is executed by the thread pool threads. In this case, we resume process data async, we write line again, we initiate the next operation, and once this operation is complete, we are again using the thread pool thread to process the data. And only when the process data async operation is fully completed, we are returning the execution to process data and update UI method, and we do this by posting the action into the synchronization context that was captured here. And that's why the next step of this method is executed by the UI thread. And once again, when process data in a sync UI operation is done, the UI thread is free to process more requests, to render the screen, etc. Today we discussed what Configurate is for and why it was added to the .NET ecosystem. I've intentionally decided not to cover the best practices, that's definitely a topic for another episode. You should remember one thing. By default, async methods capture synchronization context and task scheduler that controls how each step of the asynchronous operations are executed. And Configurate false detaches the async method from those contexts. And in this case, each step of the async method is going to be executed in the thread pool thread. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button, subscribe, and let me know in the comments below what .NET topic you want me to cover next. That's it for today, guys. Thanks for watching, be curious, and see you next time.